rebel force has penetrated the shield and landed on Endor. This is where the fun begins. A long time ago, in a galaxy far, far away. This is Rebel Force Radio. Your source for the Force. Star Wars news and commentary. With Jason Swank and Jimmy Mack. I've seen Star Wars 500 times. Star Wars number one! This station is now the ultimate power in the universe. I suggest we use it. Now it's time for Rebel Force Radio. We would be honored if you would join us. Chut, chut, one and all. Welcome back to Rebel Force Radio. Appreciate you being here. Oh, do you miss us from week to week? I know we miss you guys. Sometimes we don't give you a chance. There's always fresh content dropping over on the Patreon. In fact, we just dropped the latest RFR Q&A. And I'm plugging it this week because I'm on it. Yeah, uh, courtesy of uh, RFR Patreon, Rob Strecker, we uh, we decided to talk some Trek. Now we did a Star Trek podcast uh, on the Q and A a while back, where we were looking at the uh, the original crew films. You know, your Star Trek one, two, three, and then we um, I, I, did we swing back around and do four, five, six. Or haven't we done? I can't remember if we've done that or not. No, we're going to do that. We're going to do this. We did one, two, three, four, five, and six is coming. But this time around, Rob and I, we talked about the JJ film, the first JJ film, Star Trek, um, with, you know, that's one with Chris Pine and Zach Quinto and that other guy playing Bones. Where was that guy? From Lord of the Rings. But that's a great conversation. What's his name? Carl Urban. Carl Urban. That's right. That's right. Anyway, it's a fun conversation. So if you're into Star Trek or uh, into at least the JJ version of Star Trek, check it out over on Rebel Force Radio Patreon. Um, speaking of Patreon, that is uh, that, that network of Rebel Force Radio listeners is growing uh, by leaps and bounds, and they were a huge catapult to the Rebel Force Radio uh, rooftop bash tickets are on sale. We've got some more information about that, an update about that. Also, uh, coming up, an update on the Homer Tauntaun. Uh, yeah, we played the clip from uh, a, a, what we believe to be a prior April Fool's bit with Homer and a Tauntaun, and uh, we put the word out to Rebel Force Radio listeners. Do you remember this bit? Where did it come from? So we'll see what uh, Jimmy Mack has uh has found out courtesy of Rebel Force Radio listeners everywhere. And to speak of Jimmy Mac, he's right here. My good friend and yours from Chicago, Jimmy Mac. Hey, Jason. Hey, Star Trek fans. Yeah, April Fool's, right? We didn't play any April Fool's pranks on anybody this year. But I felt it would be appropriate to release the Star Trek episode of Q&A this week because April 5th, is commonly celebrated among Star Trek fans as being First Contact Day, April 5th, 2063. That's a thing? That's a thing now. Just like, you know, everyone wants to get that May the 4th be with you kind of vibe within their own fan base. First Contact Day. That's a great so movie. First Contact Day. It's one of the best day. Trek movies, but I don't even, I didn't walk away from it remembering that there was a specific day. For. Five sixty-three, twenty sixty-three, to be exact, and that's the date that uh, it all went down. So um, I thought it would be a good time to release the Star Trek thing, and it is April Fool. Still, is kind of in the air a little bit, and so why not uh, lay some trek on the Star Wars fans over at Patreon? And uh, yeah, it's all good stuff, and. Uh, like you said, Jason, the uh, RFR rooftop bash. Oh my God, the response to that has been spectacular. There are still limited seats available, but we have big news about the bash, Jason. Big news. Big news about the bash. That's right. We've heard. We heard you, and uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to open it up to all ages. Mm -hmm. We know that Star Wars celebration is oftentimes a big family affair, and as uh, 
tempting as it was to just dump all the kids off at Kevin Lyle's hotel for a few hours. Uh, we heard from Kevin, actually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right yeah, after he that didn't episode. like that idea. No, yeah, he, he was opposed. Like uh, yeah, so we thought, yeah. well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? We promised yeah. child care, so we'll just do it at yeah. the bash. Yeah, it was really feedback from you guys that, that really uh, sort of changed the way this is going to go down. Um, it really all came to a head as I was attending... Chicago Blackhawks Star Wars night at the United Center this past Sunday. Uh, Tyler Page was there. Chris Macht was there. The um, Blackhawks uh, Mandalorian, Sean, was there. A bunch of great Star Wars fans. Packed the building, the United Center, and uh, we watched the Hawks play, and it was a lot of fun. I met RFR listener Octavio Martinez in... The concourse. He came over and he started talking to me. We were rapping out about all kinds of things. And uh, I said, hey, are you going to the bash? He said, no, I, I can't, man. I, I got the family with me and everything. He said, I would. And I, I'm like, you know what? Okay, that does it. I said to him right then and there, I said, Octavio, I've heard from others. And I just, I, I, I this just doesn't seem right. Uh, RFR is something that we've heard time and time again, that families like to share with each other. You know, Star Wars fans have been raised on Rebel Force Radio by this point. Uh, you know, some of them. <laughs> Not old ones like me and Swank, but the, the next generation. Right. Well, yeah, you've raised. had, yeah, absolutely. You have people that started out listening to us, you know, 15 years ago, and now they have kids, and they're listening on their way to school. You know, as they're taking their kids to school. And sometimes it goes the other way around. Sometimes the kids introduce the parents to the show. So, yeah. But it's, it's definitely all in the family. Right. And we want to keep it that way. And so we want the Martinez family there. We want your family there. If you are indeed bringing uh, the crew with you to Anaheim for Star Wars Celebration, the Rooftop Bash will be kicking everything off May 25th at the 5th, which is on the rooftop of the Grand Legacy right across the street from Disneyland. The doors open at 6. That's when the party begins. The podcast happens at 7. We'll probably go to about 9 o'clock. And uh, if everything goes according to plan, there will be Disneyland fireworks across the street, clearly visible from our venue. And we'll be able to hang out and watch them together. So uh, we'll keep you up to date on that. Uh, of course, there are conditions that uh, could come into play that might prevent the fireworks from happening. I just want to say that so nobody blames us if they don't see a fireworks show. Yeah, right. Can you imagine? <laughs> yeah, it was these guys. I mean, Wait, yeah. Who would we call to make that happen? All right. <laughs> Our podcast is running over. No fireworks. <laughs> yeah, hold them We're going for 15 long. more minutes. <laughs> it's so, not yeah. going to happen. But I'll tell you what, you're going to have a gorgeous view in Anaheim, if you look, uh, yeah. you go to the website, rebelforceradio.com. We got some pictures at the 5th. The 5th's website, too, uh, also has some beautiful pictures. But it's just going to be fabulous. It really is. Yeah. This is the most gorgeous, I think, uh, atmosphere we've ever done a podcast in before, I think. Oh, no question about it. No question about it. We've done them in good places. Oh, yeah. Uh, but, you know, but... Uh, Basements. The, the fifth, other bars, prison courtyards, <laughs> slaughterhouses, <laughs> and, and church confessionals. Yes. Uh, but we've never we've never done one from the rooftop. Only once of a uh, quality hotel. So uh, the fifth will be there. They call it the fifth because it's the fifth floor of the hotel. Yeah, and uh, and it's got just got such a view of the Disney Park. It'll blow you away. So I uh, can't wait to see everyone there. If you've been on the fence about getting tickets because there was an age limit, it was 21 and over, forget about it. That's over with. That's done. The cash bar will still be open, rest assured, and Star Wars-inspired drinks will be served and consumed. But we are making the event all ages, families are welcome, and we're going to have a great time. All right. Last week on Rebel Force Radio was the April 1st, April Fool's Day edition. And Jim, you played a clip that you found in your mass, mass collection <laughs> of yeah. audio. Uh, not only do you have a ton of Star Wars you know, audio in general, but you've been putting together clips and bits and uh, bumpers and all kinds of stuff uh, for this show for a long, long time. And very rarely, because this might be something you don't know about Jimmy Mack, but he's got... 
a really great memory, like the memory of an elephant for some <laughs> things. Yeah, and one everything. of those things, right, it's very selective, but one of those yeah. things is I can, he's like Rain Man, I can say the name of a guest mm -hmm. and he'll be like, oh yeah, that was uh, September 14th, uh, 2017, <laughs> uh, I believe you were wearing a blue shirt and yeah. Um, so I don't remember I was, what clothes you wear, Swank. That is not I, in my memory bank. <laughs> Your wardrobe is the furthest thing from my memory. I was stunned, though, when he came across this clip and said, I don't remember this. I have no idea what this is from. So uh, I'll weird. play it here just to refresh everyone's mm -hmm. memory. This was it. <laughs> April Fool's. <laughs> Well, it's a it's a mashup here between uh, the Tauntaun sounds and Homer Simpson. Yeah, I know. So this caused <laughs> for uh, the opening of a investigative report. That's right, Jason. I am Jimmy Mack from the Rebel Force Radio Investigative Report, a team, and uh, we're back. We're back to investigate this weird uh, clip. That was in the RFR archives as I was searching for April Fool's audio. I found this uh, clip of uh, Homer Simpson and a Tauntaun. It was just labeled Homer Tauntaun. That's, that's kind of weird. And there was no explanation for it. So I threw it out to you guys and I said, uh, who knows where that came from? And uh, there was somebody who actually remembered uh, on uh, RFR on Patreon. You know, we have some of the, the greatest patrons over at RFR on Patreon. That is such a Star Wars fan community. And if you think I remember stuff, these guys don't forget. And uh, David Seitzinger, David Seitzinger says, I think that Tauntaun Homer Simpson soundbite might have been in reference to the Tauntaun open belly sleeping bag. The sleeping oh, bag man. was an April Fool's joke on the Think Geek website, but the response was so strong that they turned the idea into an officially licensed product. So yeah, you remember that, Jason? I the, do. Uh, the Tauntaun sleeping bag. So just to confirm that actually was why that weird soundbite was created, I went into our own personal archives and I found the actual show that soundbite was originally played, which was, I, I, I didn't pull this one up by memory. I actually had to do a little detective work to find it, uh, searching through our diaries and uh, audio folders and stuff. But I found it. it's uh, Tauntaun Sleeping Bag from April 3rd, 2009, 13 years ago. Wow. And here's me and Jason talking about that very sleeping bag. Roll the tape. <laughs> there was a story that was reported on thinkgeek.com, great blog, uh, today. And actually, it was Kyle Newman that brought it to our attention. He, he sent this along and said, have you guys seen this? And what it is, is it's... <laughs> I'm, I'm looking at the picture, and I'm, <laughs> I'm so disappointed this... Well, all right, anyway. It is a taunt... <laughs> it's a tauntaun sleeping bag. <laughs> the look on the kid's face. <laughs> All right, it's a Tauntaun sleeping bag. It's it's a sleeping bag that unzips much like <laughs> the uh the belly of the Tauntaun in Empire Strikes Back. Kids get to <laughs> sleep inside, it complete with like a Tauntaun gut lining that you <laughs> <laughs> and the, the the, the bad tail coming <laughs> coming off. I mean, it, you have to see it. Uh, and uh, You got to go to thinkgeek.com. I think it's still up there on the homepage. Jim, I, when I found out that this was, and I'll just read here, this high quality sleeping bag looks just like a Tauntaun, complete with saddle, internal intestines, and glowing lightsaber zipper pull. I mean, the zipper pull was, is the blue, you know, lightsaber from Empire. Now, when your kids tell you that their favorite Star Wars movie is Attack of the Clones, you can nestle the wee one snug and simulated Tauntaun fur 
while regaling them with the amazing tale of The Empire Strikes Back. Here are some of the features of this product. Classic Star Wars sleeping bag simulates the warmth of a Tauntaun carcass. Built-in embroidered Tauntaun head pillow. Glowing lightsaber zipper pool. Great for playing pretend save Luke from the Wampa games. <laughs> yeah. Teach your children about the best Star Wars movie ever. Fully licensed from Lucasfilm. Uh, fits children and small adults. Blah, blah, blah. Polyester. All this. I, when I saw that, I was like, this is cool. I got to mm-hmm. have this. Mm-hmm. But alas. But alas. And, and I realized that this posting coincided with April Fool's when I read this little part of the description, which you didn't see. In the sub-zero wasteland of the planet Hoth, only the strong survive. And of course, those lucky Jedi protected by the thick skin of a Tauntaun. <laughs> now, after extensive movie viewing research and analysis, Think Geek Labs has isolated the exact synthetic compounds needed to recreate <laughs> Tauntaun fur. What have we done with this supreme knowledge? Created a Tauntaun sleeping bag, of course. <laughs> Oh, come on. Synthetic Tauntaun fur. Mm. That got me scratching uh, my head a little bit. But you know what? I, like you, like Kyle, I bought it. I bought it. I mean, I didn't I didn't get a chance to buy it because. <laughs> I was going to say, I wanted to buy it. But we wanted to buy it. <laughs> oh, man. But alas. But alas. It is not real. Not to be. It wasn't real. And, uh, but I'll tell you, maybe it was, maybe it was a test. Maybe this was something that Lucasfilm did just to see if there's a market for this kind of thing. Could be because there's been an overwhelming response. <laughs> of people saying, I want this thing. Yeah. I want it. And, and we want it in adult sizes too, please. Right. You know, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm reminded, I was going to say, you know, I admire you because you got two little boys. You can justify buying this. Now I've got a six month old girl. Uh-huh. I, I doubt that when she, you know, gets to be, you know, four or five years old, she's really going to want to sleep inside of the Tauntaun carcass with the guts <laughs> in, the, the inside. In, the, in the gut sack. Uh, but, <laughs> but they really pulled this off. Think geek. Yeah. I mean, like, I mean, they really did a good job because this one, they got us. This yeah. one seemed legit. It even had a place to click to buy now. And when you click on it, it says something along the lines like, we got you, chump. Right, right, right. Something like that. But uh, disappointing for sure. But I think I think the powers to be, maybe Howard Rothman himself, <laughs> has got to be considering it now yeah. because so many people want it. We mm-hmm. got uh, flooded with emails saying, oh, I can't wait to get this. My kids are going to love it. <laughs> <laughs> April Fools. <laughs> well, I uh, I wrote Bonnie Burton at Lucasfilm an email today, and I said, "Listen, if you got enough clout to get the Darth Vader toaster made and marketed, <laughs> please put in a good word for the Tauntaun sleeping bag." Well, I don't know if it was Bonnie or who it was, but it it did happen. But it made me think. It actually made me think that maybe this is the strategy that HasLab should take. Put your, mm. Announce your HasLab on April, for, on April 1st, and then go, oh, sorry, we got gotcha. you. And mm. then watch everybody freak out and say, but I would have bought it. I'd have bought it. And then they put it on mm. sale. Let's see if that right. works. Well, you know, stranger things have happened in marketing. Of course, we do know that that sleeping bag did actually go on sale from it think did. geek later later in the year i don't know if they're still available might find them on ebay or something but uh that's uh that does solve this uh investigation you know we could close the book now on tauntaun homer the mystery has been solved we have uh audio evidence from april 3rd 2009 did you hear how young our voices were? Back oh then? my so god, I, babies, babies! How long? How wrong was I that I didn't think my kid was going to want to sleep in a tauntaun sleeping bag? She'd have loved yeah. it. She'd still love oh. it. She'd she still. I said, "Oh." Yeah. But uh, while we were talking about this last week, we did remember Bill Hader does an amazing tauntaun impersonation. It's so funny. Uh, Conan O'Brien had him do the impersonation every time he showed up on the show. <laughs> All the way up until the end. So uh, but here's this is the first time Bill did the Tauntaun impersonation on Conan. I could do a Tauntaun, which is a creature from Star Wars. <laughs> you're, a, you're a big Star Wars fan. I'm a huge you? Star Wars fan. And I don't know if anybody... Yeah, there you go. Okay, on. there's one and then... Uh, 
episodes four through six, yeah. right? Not the new There's ones. There's one right? and everyone else is pretending. <laughs> <laughs> one person was like, yeah! yeah! And everyone else was like, I'm going to get in on this. <laughs> <laughs> the Star Wars thing seems to be pretty big. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Uh, no, it was... Um, What's a, ta- a tauntaun? A tauntaun is a creature uh, from Empire Strikes Back uh, that is a... Um, uh, that Luke Skywalker and Han Solo used to ride in the land of Hoth, which is an ice planet. Uh, and I'm trying to figure out how to fit it into a sketch. Yeah. And the Tauntaun's basically, I had to, um, give me, uh, the sure. Tauntaun's basically, um. <laughs> and then dying Tauntaun. <laughs> <laughs> The crowd goes wild, and he falls. He actually falls. Like he yeah. walks around like the Tauntaun with the little arms. And uh, Bill Hader, did you catch his little jab at the prequels? I, I did. I yeah. did. But you know what? Something tells me that he actually loves the prequels, and he was just kind of covering. Because I think people went through that phase where they were like, "Oh, I, did, you know, I don't like the prequels, you know." But yeah. you know, the originals are the originals. cool. The, you know, the, the prequels are for nerds. Yeah. But did you also catch Conan O'Brien being like? What's a Tauntaun? Oh, yeah. This is a guy that drops, yeah, yeah, he drops Star Wars references all the time. And then he's talking about, you know, the ice planet, Hoth, and Conan's like, what? What what is this Hoth planet you say? I think, you know, they they were just trying to be totally transparent for the audience's sake. Mm. (laughs) You know, Conan knows damn well what a Tauntaun is. Yes, he does. uh, So so I noticed there's kind of a cultural, uh, or not cultural, a regional thing with uh, the way uh, we say Tauntaun. Like, I I hit the on more, like Tauntaun. You hear more of a thing. And and I I hear Jason more uh, sort of uh, Eastern with a Tauntaun like that. Tauntaun, yeah, I guess it is. Tauntaun. I do a a Tauntaun. (laughs) Let's talk about the Tauntaun, why don't we? How how did Bill pronounce it? Bill Hader. I think he said Tauntaun. I think he's an East guy, East Coast guy. Well, we'll play it again. He says it right at the beginning of the clip. Yeah, he does. I could do a Tauntaun, which is... Yeah, he's more of a a Tauntaun. Like T-O-N, T-O-N. Well, I'm T-O-W-N, Tauntaun. I'm torn apart about all of this. <laughs> People are lining up for Star Wars, and everybody is uh, excited, especially the Rebel Force Radio podcast. And yeah, those podcasts are great. I got to get this podcast. Your source for the Force. I'm Boba Fett. I'm here to see the mayor. Boba Fett. Um, um, do you have an appointment? I found one of his stray pets. I'm here to return it to its master. Well, I don't see your name in the schedule. Star Wars, Star Wars Cantina. Where are you going, master? For a drink. Sorry about the mess. You will never find the more wretched hive of scum and villainy. We must be cautious. <laughs> All right, there he is, Galen Howard. You know him. Hey, guys. Hello. (laughs) Hey, Galen. Star Wars fans, of course, know him as the City Hall Clerk from uh, the Book of Boba Fett. (laughs) Yeah, that was my my christened name. Yep. Yeah. And and that's what my parents called me. Yeah. I got to say right off the bat, man, like. The look you had in this show and and the look that you, you know, you cultivate is mm-hmm. like, uh, I mean, did you ever think that you were going to, like, end up with that in, in Star Wars? I mean. Never. Never. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I mean. It, uh, it's it was funny. a disconnect it's, for somebody. They're like, whoa, the absolutely. dude's got a mullet and he's in Star Wars. <laughs> yeah. Though it's interesting because I would, when, when it, later I. When other people saw me in it and, uh, you know, or I, I tell some close friends and there are f- a few who picked up on it and said like, oh, yeah, that's the 70s look they're going for, you know, because mm, you do see it a true. little bit in some of the, you know, sometimes they will hearken back to the, yeah. the original 70s style that was yeah. kind, of, kind of leaked into the originals. So, yeah. Shaggy hair. A little shaggy. Uh, long yeah, little sideburns. Shaggy, yeah. You know, Sideburns. you're absolutely right, Galen, because I'll tell you, when when we first saw you on the screen in Book of Boba Fett, I was a little skeptical. I go, I don't know if this feels like Star Wars. And then I caught Rogue One on cable. Mm. And all of a sudden, I'm like, 
wait a minute, wait a minute. They've, this movie was just made not that long ago. And they got the, the, the dudes with the sideburns and the stashes and all of that. And yeah. Star Wars is so ingrained uh, for, for you know, kids that grew up uh, when I did, when Jimmy did, when you did, yeah. that you, al- you almost don't see the, at least I don't, you don't necessarily see the dated aspects of the universe because it's just become Star Wars. So it sort of just becomes this, this thing. And then all of a sudden you're like, yeah. yeah, you know, as much as George likes to say that he avoided fashion and avoided all this stuff, eh, it looks a little seventies. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but it, but it does. Yeah. It's anything that becomes part of the zeitgeist, part of the, part of the culture. Yeah. You kind of forget it. You, you, it transcends whatever time it came out of. So you kind of forget that. I mean, same as, you know, like when you think about the styles of like, you know, the original Star Trek or, you know, anything else, like you look at it and it's like, oh yeah, like that's echoing of the sixties, you know, some mm-hmm. of the mod style, the haircuts, but you don't think of it that way, you know, and the right. same with Star Wars, same with so many other cultural things that transcend certain time periods. But there are those little hints, those little those little clues of like, oh, yeah, that's right. But you're you're so immersed in it that you forget that. Hey, Galen, number one, I think the mullet and the mustache, that's a fabulous trademark for you. Oh. And as a former mullet wearer myself, mm. I, I give you mad props. That's a sweet mullet, dude. Oh, that thanks, is a sweet dude. mullet. Yeah. And it, it yeah. stands out. There, there was something, as soon as I saw you in the book of Boba Fett, there was something uh, I, I said, I, I've seen him before. I don't know where, but I've seen him before. And I did eventually discover where it was that I saw you originally. But I'll, I'll get to that later. What I want to oh, know okay, about now. Okay, okay. That'll, <laughs> yeah, that'll be fun. That'll be fun. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But uh, w- what I want to talk about is how did you get the gig? How, how did you land in Star Wars? Yeah. You know, it, it's the craziest thing about it is how easily in the moment it just fell in place there really what it wasn't a big story it was you know i mean it was in the sense of like at the time you know we're all in lockdown you know work is just beginning to get back i mean i think i i um i had the audition in october of 2020 and you know so at that point things were production was just beginning to kick back and you know and it was all very experimental at that point they had it was in the first round of the covid protocols and you know it was some productions were getting shut down you know it was it was everything was up in the air so i'd begun getting some some auditions and um again that fall and then this one came up and came through and it was um of course everything was hush hush but you know the the only clue was specified you know untitled uh disney lucas film <laughs> property so mm. that kind of narrows it down. What could it be? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. So I think the the sides were um, were pretty much uh, were pretty much as you see it. I think they they gave some code name for for Boba Fett. Of course, you know, you didn't know what who that was. I think my character was was my character because that was that's pretty nondescript. And the sides were pretty much as you see it in the. The script. There was a, a little bit. They they made some changes on the day, but more or less, it's you know what you see. You know, there's not much you can do with a couple lines. I think I did you know one read of it that was you know kind of flat and a one lead that was maybe a little heightened because I could tell like okay this is this is sci-fi. This is you know this is in another you know another world, another galaxy. Uh, so um, yeah, so I think I just I I. I, you know, I, 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 I send my tape, you know, I think at that point, you know, we're all doing our tapes in our bedrooms. You know, I think mm. I had like some, it's a, a friend of mine read with me over the zoom, that sort of thing, sent the tape off, you know, didn't hear anything for about a week. Then about a week later, it was like, let's put a hold. And then like a day later it was like, oh, there's, here's the, here's the straight offer for, you know, the mystery Lucas uh, Disney product, you know, that right. we, you know, no clue what that could be. Well, the one the one interesting thing, and I can say this now, uh, is that um, the week that I got the offer, um, I also tested positive. Oh, yes. no. So thankfully, it was um, I, I booked a month out. I got my negative test right in time, right when they started testing. Wow. But yeah, there was about two weeks of like, 
Yeah. Is, yeah, because back you know, then you the, had to quarantine for like, yeah, 10 days, 14 yeah, days. Yeah. Was, so, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, yeah, I was, yeah. So I like quarantined for two weeks, then got my test and I was fine. But, you know, there was that time where it's like, yeah, we, we still didn't know how long it would last for, you know, for some people, you know, it was at least two weeks they were saying at that point. We didn't know. But yeah, that was fun. And, uh, but yeah, then. Uh, once it rolled around, it was just, um, you know, once I was in the clear, then, you know, we, they then all the magic got to happen. You know, we got the, the costume fittings, the, you know, everything. And then just uh, and then it was about about two straight days of filming um, in the um, on, on the volume. And it was a dream come true. I got to ask, because if anybody goes to your, you know, your IMDb, I mean, dude, I mean, you're just the epitome of the working <laughs> actor. I mean. Just sure. your credits go and go and go and go. So my point is you've seen a lot. You've been on a lot of sets. You've, mm-hmm. you've worked with a lot of, obviously, a lot of directors. Um, Star Wars is known for its secrecy, as you pointed out. You know, they yep. were very hush-hush. They had code names for characters. When you actually got code there and got code on names st- for the product, everything, yeah. Everything, everything hush hush. Yeah. How did your experience differ on the set of this than, you know, the other kind of more run of the mill stuff that, that you've done? Well, yeah, I, you know, I mean, I, it's a I mean, it's a well-oiled machine as you can imagine. Everything was very by the book. Uh, you know, as far as the differences, it's a, you know, it's you know, it's so funny. It's like for the most part it it runs pretty much the same until, you know, you you get on set and you know, you see, you know, Twilex and Gamorians, you know, <laughs> it's, it all feels the same until right. You become, <laughs> you're in the star Wars galaxy. Yeah. That's yeah. very, are you cool. a big star Wars fan yourself? You know, I, um, I certainly, you know, as so many of us grew up on it, I, um, I mean, star Wars had a, a special significance for me because, um, my father was a sculptor and did, sculptural design for a living and one of his first gigs out in california was working at lucasfilm on return of the jedi and the model wow no way yeah. wait, wait wait what, so, what, what did he do uh, for jedi he um he was in the um he was in the modeling department kind of adjacent with the um with costuming so he built the prototype um busts of some of the, the major helmets in return of the jedi including um the Red Guard helmet, um, wow. Princess Leia's um, a, um, a trooper a trooper helmet, and yeah. uh, and the Biker Scout helmet. Wow! wow. What's your dad's What's your dad's <laughs> name? Uh, his name is James Howard. I think that's how he was credited. Yeah, we everyone knew, uh, his friends knew him as Jim, but yeah, he I think he was James Howard in the credits. I mean, that had oh, been cool. pretty cool growing up, and your dad's working on Star Wars. Yeah, that was a yeah. It was a, it was it was cool. It was um, yeah. I think that was his. That was his one. That was his really one big gig in in um, in film, and uh, then he went into uh, toy design primarily, and uh, and actually some of his. Um, if you remember, um, in the in the eighties, I think one of his first gigs was he from his uh, Lucasfilm connection. He sculpted some coin banks um, oh. in the eighties. Yeah, so there was like a coin bank of the of the Red Guard, and I think of the Gamorrean mm-hmm. as well. I think there was there was those those two. Yeah, so when they, that's they, pretty yeah. cool when you think about the same guy that sculpted the helmet for the film sculpted, mm-hmm. you know, the toy, the in this Some case the, the coin bag. Yeah. That yeah. is really cool. Wow, that's <laughs> yeah. awesome, man. Yeah, I'll give you one of my um one of my favorite stories. Uh he also did some of the rubber stamps. There was a, a chain of um, Star Wars rubber stamps and, mm-hmm. um, you know, where it would be the they would sculpt the little there would be a little figure on the, uh, you know, for the body of the stamp. Right. Um, and um, and so so they sculpted, uh, you know, a number for Star Wars, including one for Yoda. And it was about a, a one inch figure. And at that time, you know, you would sculpt the figure, you'd send it in and then they would send it back with notes. So it was like <laughs> a whole week process, you know, very different from what we do now. And so I think they sent it back and um, their note was um, Yoda's smile needs to be more benevolent. <laughs> And that was what Lucas wrote. Uh, Of course, yes, of course, (laughs) right? Characters, anything. He's everything but benevolent. They they literally took a little, (laughs) you know, took little tweezers and went, and sent it back. (laughs) Benevolent tweezers. Yes. That is, yes. Oh, is that Benevolent tweezers, yes. Yeah, Zircon encrusted benevolent tweezers. Yeah. You know, you spent a lot of uh, your time on the set of the Book of Boba Fett sharing scenes with... um, 
uh, David Pasquazzi's, uh, yeah, his unnamed major domo character. Yeah, we got to get you guys some names. You, you need some I know. Star Wars. Yeah, names, we're so. gonna. Yeah, we need to. We they need to work on that. You know. Boy, I yeah. tell you what, if they would have been cranking out these action figures like they used to back in the seventies and eighties, y'all would have had names by now. Right. Because they, they had exactly. to name them for the it'll, toys. It'll come, ar- it'll come around. I mean, you yeah. know, time has told that just at the end of the day, just about everyone gets their gets their own figure, their own their their own history, you know, everything. So, you know, it's a, that's the fun part of it. Yeah, right, right, right. So sooner or later, it might be. Sooner or later, someone will, you know, someone will add it to the canon, you know. Yeah, you'll end up in a comic book or something in a couple of panels. (laughs) That's the the crazy thing. Yeah. Oh, look at that. Yeah. Yeah, uh, there yeah, there's uh, yeah. David Pasquazzi. Now, he's a really talented actor, and oh, he yeah. uh, played the deliciously slimy Major Domo. Uh, do you guys have a history uh, working together, or uh, is no, this the, the first, first time, time we met? Yeah. But he was, mm-hmm. he, he, was, he was great. You know, he was, you know, I, I was kind of the newbie on set at that point. I think everyone, you know, um, obviously the stars, and, you know, I think he we had been there, you know, from the beginning, and then, um, you know, before, before Boba Fett, of course, and then, you know, he had shot his his previous episodes and some of his other scenes already. So I was kind of integrating, you know, with the rest of the crew, but um, yeah, he was great, you know, and he of course has a quite a, you know, an an improv background and, Mm -hmm. but was very reserved, very, very much in character. You know, he was, he was great. Yeah. You're there with guys like, you know, also with Tim Morrison on, on the set, who's, who's been there, done that when it comes to star Wars. Was, is there a moment for, for some of you that, that, that aren't, you know, in the family, so to speak, until now, where you like kind of look at each other and you're like, holy crap, are we doing Star Wars? I mean, we're, we're doing a... St- <laughs> there were moments, yeah. I mean, I think when we first stepped on the volume, I think that might have been David's first time in the volume as well. And I think he just kind of looked around. It's like, wow, this is, you know, this is insane. You know, the thing <laughs> that, you know, to tell your younger self that you'd be here one day is kind of surreal. Had you kept up with uh, the the Disney Plus side of the star wars saga with yeah, mandalorian, with mandalorian. And, yeah exactly yeah yeah i mean it was it was interesting yeah because you know they they hadn't announced the you know book of boba fett at that point so i think they were so secretive i mean i'm sure they they probably revealed it to david and some of the other and kind of characters at his level but um it, it was never quite clear if this was a if this was Mando season three or, or what? Um, because Fennec and, um, and, and, uh, Boba had of course made their, their appearance on, uh, on, on Mandalorian season two. Yeah. So it wasn't know, that clear to the, us watching the show either, whether it was well, Mando right, season exactly. three versus <laughs> its own thing. What's going to be its own thing. Yeah. So, right. yeah. So it was only after that they made, I think a couple weeks later, they made the official announcement and then you pieced it together. I was like, Oh, that's what's coming next. Okay. Yeah. Got it. So that's what it was, you know, but, um, yeah, it was, it was very cool. You know, the whole, the whole thing. Did you have any interaction with Ming-Na Wen at all? A uh, little bit, a cool? little yeah. bit. Yeah. I think we, we were all stationed a little, you know, kind of on and in, in holding in the back and, um, you know, I think between, between setups and, yeah, I think, um, I, I think David and myself and her and, um, uh, yeah, she was just, you know, She's a pro, you know, she's uh, just incredibly, incredibly laid back, no ego. You know, she's just a working, you know, I'd actually, I'd seen her on set before on, um, I don't think we, we didn't have any scenes together, but I, I did a couple days on, um, on uh, Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. So, oh. um, yeah, so I, um, yeah, I had a, I had a co-star on that um, a couple of years previous. So, you know, we had been in the same world before. But yeah, she was lovely. Yeah. Just, you know, that it, makes it, me, I, I've been wanting to ask, and I think you're the perfect type of, of actor to ask this of, you know, when you, when you, th- when you're a kid and you're growing up and you're thinking about working in the film industry, the TV business, uh, Jimmy mm-hmm. Max case, the radio business, uh, I work in uh, live theater. You, yeah. you think of it as this big, big world. And then you yeah. get into it and people tend to say the same thing. It's actually kind of a small universe. You run into a lot of times the same people over and over again. It, do you find the that as the you're case? in there? Yeah. Over time, it's like, you know, you, you just keep running into the same people and it's like a lot of the same, you know, the longer you're in it, there'll always be new people, but there'll be a lot of people who drop out, you know? And yep. so like the, you will just end up, you know, 
inevitably see you know see the same people, be it a a crew member, or someone in art department, yeah. a DP, a camera person, you know, it's like, Oh yeah. And so and, be and nice to people actors. because chances yeah. are you're going to be working oh. with them again. Right. <laughs> Don't burn bridges. <laughs> right. Oh yeah. yeah. Who were the directors in the two episodes you were featured in? My, my first, uh, the, the episode, episode two was, um, with my kind of major scene with the, um, you know, little, st- <laughs> yeah. little standoff scene was, um, directed by Steph Green. Um, mm. she's directed a lot of television, a lot of like episodes of the Watchmen and other, yes. you know, other major, major television shows. Um, a short film of hers was actually nominated for an Academy award about 15 years back. Um, oh, no so kidding. she's got some, she's definitely got some credentials. Um, and she was, she was lovely. Um, yeah, she's, um, she was very, very encouraging. You know, I think on, um, on her episode, um, my character in that scene was originally written as being a little more nervous. Like when Boba kind of shows off a captured assassin, my reaction was written as being a little more kind of hemming and hawing a little, uh, you know, like that. And so I was doing that. And so I did it as written. And then she kind of ushers in and just goes like, okay, it's, it's not working. And, you know, and immediately jumped on, it was like, but nothing to do with what you're doing. You know, we're, you know, we're realizing what, you know, the way we've written it isn't delivering. So we're going to kind of troubleshoot. And so then they kind of developed a little more business for me, which was great. And so then that created the whole bit of like looking at the schedule, more kind of making the character a little more bureaucratic. Yeah. And- we, we kind of talked on the show that you might've modeled this character after, after an experience at the uh, BMV or one of those yeah. kind of government, <laughs> one of those exactly. government offices. Yes, exactly. 100%. It's, um, that's basically what they said. Like just, you know, you're, it's, this is just another day at the office. And, <laughs> you know, they said words to that effect, you know, you're just kind of, you're not impressed. This is just another guy coming through. You've mm. seen it before. You're, you're waiting to clock off, you know? And so that, <laughs> that became the moment that became the joke. And that, be- that, that really kind of what, what made that scene come to life. And so yes. that was, that was really awesome to be, a part of that and they were issue and she was just she was so gracious was at the end of the day just you know very gracious for saying how much she appreciated how i took the adjustment and everything you know very welcoming very gracious and um and then the the second day you know i on the second episode and we shot those two episodes those two days back to back um when i pop up again in the towards the end of episode three chapter three um that was directed by by rodriguez Oh, that Ooh. was Robert Rodriguez. That was Rodriguez. Now, see, I, I find that interesting. So you did these back to back days, mm-hmm. two separate yeah. episodes, two separate episodes. Yeah, because they were and, they and two, two separate directors. Yeah. yeah, and two separate directors. Right. So this adds yeah. up because uh, Jennifer Beals. Yeah. who uh, appeared in a, a few episodes. She had made mm-hmm. a comment before the season even began that she was only on the set for one day of shooting, but she appeared in three episodes directed by three different directors. And so I thought yeah. there's something not right about what <laughs> she's saying, wow, but that, wow. Uh, they, I didn't realize it was, it was all, com- it was all compact into one day. That's crazy. I mean, at least I had the transition, but to, but yeah. man, to, to try to, to to cycle through three directors on one day. Wow. That must have been crazy. Mm, so, yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I yes. but uh, that that's really interesting. Uh, did John yeah. Favreau or Dave Filoni insert themselves into the Oh, uh, the, process? They were definitely, aware, especially John. I think, you know, Dave was definitely hovering around there. But, yeah, John was, John was there kind of overseeing the rehearsals, weighing in, um, you, you know, constantly. Um he was very much involved. Um, he and uh, the three of them, he, 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 Filoni and Rodriguez were, were there to kind of approve our costumes when I had my fitting. So they ushered a few of us in and just to, to kind of get the yes or no. And so, so I met them on that day on before filming his attitude, his, um, his whole, uh, demeanor was just, you know, very laid back, uh, really pleasant professional, um, just really puts you at ease, you know, where, you know, you kind of just get the sense of like, oh, we're, we're all just playing with the really big Lego blocks, you know? 
<laughs> you know, that's just that's kind of nice. the sense you get. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, I think at one point, you know, the the costumer was, was showing, you know, kind of presented me in wardrobe to him. And, and she was kind of concerned about, like, if the ranking of my badges were correct and everything. She was like, oh, is, is this OK? Does this how does this look? And and he just like looks glances over and goes, yeah, yeah, that looks Star Warsy enough. <laughs> How did you feel putting it on and seeing yourself in a mirror? Did you feel oh. Star Warsy enough? I I would say so. Yeah, it was <laughs> it was it, it was a trip, man. It was a real it was a trip. Yeah, even just every every time you know, I look at it, it's just like you know, it's just it's just surreal. Just to to see yourself in the in that world is surreal, you know. Yeah, and yeah, yeah it just it still doesn't feel real, but um. Another noteworthy um, experience was um, on on the first episode when um, when Steph Green was directing. The DP at the ca- on camera was uh, Dean Cundy, and that was a, that was a re- you know as a film as a cinephile that was a big that was a real treat. Well, fill us uh, amateur cinephiles in uh, who this individual <laughs> okay. is. Um, okay, well, Dean Cundy. If anyone is familiar, he's a uh, he, you know, um, he's a huge, um, he's very big in the film world. Um, uh, you know, is shot a lot for, um, for Zemeckis shot the, 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 the back to the future trilogy shot, uh. um, Halloween and the thing for John Carpenter. He shot Jurassic park, any like film geek film, especially film tech geek, the name Dean Cundy, you know, holds a lot of, holds a lot of weight. So, so that was a thrill too, to have your, you know, my, my big close up lensed by you know you know a legend like that so that's very cool um, wow awesome yeah yeah so, so well i i think we're uh, at the part of the interview where i am going to now reveal where i i saw you prior to book of boba fett okay i, so, I I'll, I'll, yeah i won't even try to guess yeah <laughs> lay it on me take one guess just one guess because i bet you'll well, guess right okay my my, my my first guess would be, um, if it's not Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D., it would be um, um, uh, Brooklyn Nine-Nine. There you go. That's Brooklyn it. Nine-Nine. Yeah. Andy yeah. Samberg, Brooklyn yeah. Nine-Nine. And um, you, you, were, you were part of the Boyle family. The Boyle clan. The Boyle cousins. The Boyle clan. I'm sorry, clan. Oh, it's, there's no official specific. term, but uh, yeah, that's my <laughs> that's my affectionate term for I, it. Yes. No, I think they I think they were referred to as the Boyle clan in. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Uh, well, the they're, well, the, right? the joke was is that they were is that they were all cousins, but it's like how can mm-hmm. they all be cousins to each other? It's, it's <laughs> a, <laughs> that was the fun. That was the funny part. It was. It's. Uh, yeah, I mean, oh, that's I. I have such fond memories of that, and I'm. I was. It was such a privilege that they, you know, to not only do the first episode I did, you know, about uh, about five years ago, but then to be brought back for the final season was yeah, oh, last yeah, year. That yeah, yeah. The, this past year that was th- that was great, and uh, yeah, to you know to to share the screen with you know people like you know Sandberg and Terry Crews and Tr- Joe Latrulio. I mean, yeah, just. Uh, yeah, it, it it was it was such a treat. Well, we have a clip. <laughs> <laughs> did you bring a clip? Uh, that's what you do when you come on shows like this. Oh, we man, got the clip. You don't need to bring it. We got yeah, it. Here right, it well, yeah, exa- exactly. <laughs> well, no, this would um, this would be where I would pull a Paul Rudd and play a clip from Mac and Me. <laughs> <laughs> it was such a great party. Everyone had the best time. I mean, except for Lyndon. Lyndon wasn't happy? Yeah, it was strange. He was passing through the living room. And I asked him if he wanted a little HJ, but he just ignored me. I mean, who doesn't want an HJ from their cousin? Hold up. An HJ? A head job, a massage. Well, isn't that what everyone calls it? You Absolutely bet. not. <laughs> 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 oh yeah, HJ. Uh, uh, yeah. Oh, I mean, you're. J- <laughs> There's no way you can go wrong when you're when you have gold like that. You know, it's just oh, you, that's, that is such a gift when you know with with writers like that. And yeah, I mean, you just you just get to have fun. More often than not, I'd say that's that's my been my experience. And also, you've uh, shot some music videos, most notably with Justin Timberlake. Can't stop the feeling. What a great song that is. That was the summer hit. I mean, I'm I'm a bit of a snob when it comes to music, a little bit yeah, of a little bit both. of a cynic, but but even I was like, oh, this 
This is a great. This is a great song. Oh, it's a wonderful song. It's it it a just great puts song. a smile on your face. It's joyous. A hundred percent. Yo, I've done a lot of music videos, and I always say, you know, if I don't hate the song by the end of the shoot, um, yeah. you know, after after they've done playback thirty times all day, you know, it's a that's a good sign. I still love that song. I still love that video. You know. Um, oh, Jason just put up a screen grab. Uh, it, actually. Um, Galen is in this shot dancing behind Justin, but you can't see it in the picture of Jason. You just see his hand. You just see my hand. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, that's funny. Okay, I see where I stand. Okay, okay. Throughout the video, you're with about a half dozen other people, and they just do cutaways of of what you know appears to be just uh, regular Joes out dancing to this Justin Timberlake music. And uh, you're you were dancing in front of Randy's Donuts, the famous donut shop in California. Yes, and in with the giant donut. Yeah, you know the Simpsons did a little tribute to Randy's Donuts with the big donut the, on top. Yeah, of the it was like the mashup of like Big Boy and Big and Randy's Donuts. Yeah, <laughs> yeah they give like right, the big right. boy char- They give like the big boy character. Yeah, Lard Lad. You know, basically holding a donut. Yeah, it's like <laughs> Big Boy meets meets Randy's Donuts with the donut. Yeah. Um, and you're dancing, man. You're dancing. Yeah, well, my, yeah. my wife would be very envious of you getting the view behind Justin Timberlake uh, in that <laughs> in that video. She would say you had the best the best shot in the whole place. <laughs> <laughs> That's totally fair. He is. Uh, you know, I I don't think anyone would, uh, you know, fight you when saying he's easy on the eyes. You know, I think, he's yeah, he, he is a high accomplished specimen, you know. That's um, right. That's and right. Uh, and um. And I must say, a, a an absolute gentleman and um, and consummate professional on set yeah. went out of his way to introduce himself uh, at the beginning of the day and thank everyone individually at the end. He was, mm. you know, yeah, ab- absolutely, you know, no ego. He joked with the cast between takes, um, went out of his way to make people feel at ease. And, you know, and I think that's exactly what the video called for. You know, everyone needed to, you know, kind of, we all needed to feel, you know, like we we're you know, in a big family, you know, yeah. and that's we're at a party. Yeah, that's what came out. A big party. We had a big party. Right. A big party. Cool. Yeah. And the, um, and uh, also another, uh, another insider bit for, um, for film geeks is the director of that was, a uh, was a guy named Mark Romanek, who's a big, uh, done, done huge music videos, everything from Nine Inch Nails closer to, uh, um, to videos for like Madonna and, you know, also directed the, um, the film one hour photo, uh, oh, Robin Williams. Yeah. So yeah, nice. that yeah. So dealing with some big, big titans, you know, in all mediums. So that was yeah, that was a, that that video was rad. Well, that's a great story. Um, you you say that you're a music snob, and if you to make it through an entire music video shoot without getting sick of the song, that means something. That means it's a good song. But you shot a video for Weezer, and yeah. I think by the end of that shoot, you weren't sick of the song, but you were sick of cannolis. You bet I was. You're shoving cannolis in your face throughout the entire video, and I'm thinking, oh, dear God, if they had to shoot multiple takes of this stuff, oh. you probably put on 20 pounds during that shoot. Oh, I well, uh, yeah. That whole concept was was assembled very quickly. I think, you know, they, they booked me and shot me within 24 hours, and if memory serves me correctly, and... They just brought a huge platter of cannoli, as you see in the video, and (laughs) hadn't really given thought as for, like, pacing the actor. So I had to kind of weigh in at a certain point. I think I've I got about two or three in in a span of about 10 minutes and, uh, you know, realized that, you know, like they say in Arrested Development, I've made a huge mistake. Um, (laughs) And then... um, uh, yeah, and I I think about that time I'd say okay we're gonna need we're gonna need to do some movie movie magic here you know I think <laughs> I've got about I've got about one left and then we gotta yeah <laughs> and, those are huge yeah. cannolis too I mean you know, they're like foot long cannolis yeah, yeah. Um, um, when, when people would hear about that shoot like they would um, it was it was so funny how quickly they would go from envy to disgust you know when, <laughs> you know from from uh, you know hearing that i got to eat cannoli to knowing how many cannoli i had to eat in a span of 15 minutes uh, i bet you your know? dentist was happy about that oh right yeah i think yeah i think one person said oh you got to eat you eat, eat those cannoli that was great i said i eat five in 15 minutes and he immediately said that's gross <laughs> i think that is something that i, I can't remember who I was talking to at one point about food 
on on a film set. And yeah. and big thing. Yeah, it is. You it was Warwick and, Davis. That's right, Warwick mm-hmm. Davis. When he was talking oh, wow. about being on the set of episode one during the oh, pod wow. race sequence, they were doing um, shots of the of the gallery, the crowd there at the pod race, and uh, they yeah. were all eating. And you know, he said you get you know, the first few takes, you're all excited, and you're like, "Man, we're doing Star Wars again. This is great!" And eat and eat. <laughs> well, the. He just kept eating and kept eating and kept eating, and they're baking in the sun there, on Tunisia in Tunisia, and he he basically fell asleep or passed yeah, out one, one or the other. Right, fell asleep. <laughs> he fell asleep, and George is directing. This isn't second unit. George is directing, Ooh. and so <laughs> I think George, if I remember the story right, had to mm-hmm. wake him up. Like, yeah, no sleeping on my chicken. set. <laughs> yeah, we we'll smack upside the 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 the, um, the Ewok head. Yeah, yeah, so there's food comas, and then there's just getting you know half sick from the from the yeah food when itself. you're eating something that rich. Yeah, you know, right. And well, yeah, and then it's like you know it's consistency. So like anytime right. you you eat something, you know you you know eat every time you do a motion, you have to repeat that. You right. know, mm-hmm. so yeah, you have to you know um, so yeah, so so it's a lot of like knowing where what you see in frame, you know, what you can fake, what you can't, you know, I mean, you know, I've, um, um, you know, I've never had to do a spit bucket, you know, um, I've heard of that <laughs> though. Yeah. Oh I've... yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> all, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Thank, and thank goodness. Cause yeah, the, there's nothing to me, like there's nothing more sickening than like s- seeing food spit up. That's right. Yeah. That's like one of no. those, like, Yeah. Visceral, uh, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's gross. Hey, you said you're a music snob. Uh, just give us an example of some music you listen to, just to satisfy my curiosity. Oh man, I mean, I'm a little bit of everything. I listen across genres. I love Tom Waits. I love Nick Cave, uh, Iggy Pop. Uh, mm. You know, um, Miles Davis. Just a little bit of everything in between. Um, mm. I w- um, relating it back to Star Wars, though. I um, I, I'm I'm also a big fan of the um, of the blues musician Taj Mahal, and oh, I yes. and I just I only recently in the last few months found out that he did the first season of the of, of the Ewok TV yeah, show. That's right. Yeah, yeah. He did the theme that, song. The yes, which is, I. I, I that I, I I could not stop laughing when I heard that. I was it's because it is so I love Taj Mahal and I love Ewoks and there's like nothing more incongruous than that theme song. <laughs> I can definitely see why else. they got yeah. the why they uh, yeah. Star Wars has really had, you know, that. Star Wars has has had a, a history with that, you know, the brush with uh you know, celebrity uh, rock stars, John Bon Jovi on the uh, Christmas in the Stars uh, album. Oh, that's, um, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And then uh, was it uh, the guy from the police that did the theme song Stuart for Copeland uh, did, uh, did droids? Yeah. Droids. Yeah. 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 And yeah. Taj Mahal you know, did Ewoks. Boy, George didn't mess around with that stuff. No, <laughs> I know. It's a, it, Yeah. I mean, I will say Taj Mahal is a very odd choice. I don't know what, yeah. <laughs> where that came from. I love right, it. I right. mean, I, I love that something like that exists uh, because uh-huh. it's so incongruous. I love that. It sounds like just otherworldly, like some kind of insect ritual. It's I, <laughs> I just I love it. It's so weird. It's so weird. Yeah, it's but yeah. Weird. I love I love little anomalies like that. That's what I love about the Star Wars universe. Is you know, like the further down you go, the rabbit hole is. There's always just like little Easter eggs, like crazy that. connections. They talk about you know the six degrees of Kevin Bacon. You pl- you can play. The two degrees of Star Wars, you oh, know, yeah. because it's just so, uh, it's just, you know, encompassed so many great artists over the years. Really cool to hear about your dad, James Howard, who yeah. contributed to Star Wars and Return oh, of the Jedi. Yeah. And then, you know, some of the merchandise and here you are, you know, all those years later, uh, contributing yeah. to Star Wars in your own way. That's just, it's a great full circle thing. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for saying that. That's, I, I, it, was, it meant a lot to me too. Yeah, I, you know, and yeah, he's, um, you know, sadly no longer with us. But I know he would be, um, he he would be overjoyed. And I'm, you know, yeah. you know, I, I'm, you know, I'm, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm spiritually a little bit of a literalist, but I, you know, I, I do, I do imagine that he's, that, that he's, that he's out there just tickled, you know, at this. Getting so. a kick out of that for Getting sure. Getting a kick out of that. Yeah. And, um, full circle. I know that, uh, you know, as Yoda, Master Yoda is fond of saying, always mm-hmm. in motion is the future. We don't know what yes. the future brings, but, uh, I know that, uh, there are a lot of bureaucrats in the Star Wars galaxy, and <laughs> is if there's some chance that we may see City Hall Clerk again. I like to think that this guy could be, um, you know, uh, like a uh, kind of one of those characters that just sort of pops up here and there, you know, just all oh. of a sudden, like anytime there's like some sort of government office, this dude <laughs> is there. there. It's like, course, how does this yeah. guy always show <laughs> How does this guy yeah. always get this gig? <laughs> that would be amazing to me. I yeah, you know, I'd like to see him come back as the road manager for Max Repo. <laughs> uh, right. He moves into music. Now is Max Repo dead? A lot of people are thinking that mm. when uh the bomb went there, off in the club. That's right. That that's right. There is so down. much. Yeah. Yeah. Um mm. You, you never know, know yeah. though. I mean, it is Star Wars. So, I mean, they brought Darth Maul back. They brought other characters. They brought Fennec Shand back. They brought Boba yeah, Fett back. You know, it's all up for grabs. Yeah, you can give him a son or a twin brother. You know, right? That's you know, true. I'm sure. You know, <laughs> yeah, they'll have someone else. You know, you know, get the band back together. Do like a Country Bears take on um, the Max Repo band. You know, something like that. Oh, Bear, Bear Jamboree with the, the Bear Rainbow Jamboree, Band. yes. With, yeah, <laughs> why with why aren't they the doing Bear, that at yeah. Disneyland already? What's going on here? That's right, the, the exactly. best idea I've heard so far. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Or have uh, the Rebo Band take over the Tiki Room. Well, that would you, be interesting. Yes, yes, or yes, exactly. <laughs> I I really want to I really want to see the Max Rebo Band like they're doing with Electric Mayhem with the Muppets. I want to see them yes. go. Oh, wouldn't well, that be great? And maybe they could the Max Rebo Band. They could rip into yes. a tune like we this. Oh, you can't you you can't help but jam out to that. You know, it is a that's a banger. It's a weird song, but it's such a banger. Yeah, it really Blues is. legend Taj Mahal checking into a galaxy far, far away. Oh, well, I'm glad wait. you checked into the galaxy too, Me Galen. Too, you're man. you're a great a guy. Thank you. And I mean, you're just a, a great guy. The the clerk. We want to see your mullet back in Star oh. Wars again. And yeah. if you're attached to it, that's even better. Yeah, give me, you know, g- you know, give me an excuse to save on a set to save money on a haircut, you know. <laughs> there it is. There it is. Come on, and, man. Yeah. Now that the pandemic's over, we need excuses again for you know you not should, getting I a know. haircut. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, yeah. That was. Um, yeah. Yeah. That was. Yeah. I. Uh, yeah. I was able to. I was able to put my uh, my pandemic hair to, to use. You know. Yeah. The, you know the end of that year. Peak mullet. Peak mullet. Peak mullet, boy, let me tell you. (laughs) And uh, I'm happy you made it through the the COVID okay. uh, Oh, yeah. yeah. I think we're all, too bad for you. Everyone has a story at this point, you know. Yeah, yeah, most of us are part of the club, so in one way or Mm -hmm. another. So, you know, but yeah, we're all, um, I think, you know, we're all just happy to be working and, uh, you know, and getting to do, you know, crazy, insane, wonderful stuff like this. And, you know, and I'm, now that you know things are kind of reaching a little bit of normalcy, we can um, you know be able to to visit with the fans at conventions and things like that. So oh, great, great. Well, we look forward to seeing you out there, man. And uh, yeah. best of luck and great success to you with your career. And uh, yeah. thank you so much for joining us here on Rebel Force Radio. If, if uh, listeners want to learn more about Galen Howard, visit GalenHoward.com. That's your official site. And yeah. uh, you got some good reels there. And uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can find me on uh, on Twitter, Instagram, you know, all that stuff. You know, um, yeah, I'm, I'm my, uh, my face is out there. Awesome. Yes. And what a face. And we love it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Galen. Take care, Thanks, my guys. friend. Take care. Great guys. talking to you. Oh yeah. What a nice dude. Great guy. Great yeah. guy. Real nice. Yeah, Real he was nice. great. He was great. Mm-hmm. He's worthy of the mullet. For sure. <laughs> I have good news for you, my lord. That's good news. Come closer, I have good news. Oh man, for this one. 
A long time have we been waiting, but it's finally here. Lego, the Star Wars Skywalker Saga video game out in stores now. I don't know about you all. I've had mine. I feel like I've had mine on pre-order for two years, I think, uh, when it was initially. I think it, they kicked the uh, the release date down the they kicked that release date can down the road a couple of times, uh, largely due to the pandemic. And then once they started, my understanding, because my son follows this stuff, is once they realized they weren't going to hit the first date because of COVID, they thought, well, we have an opportunity to add more characters and make this game better. And so things like, Hmm. you know, the Mandalorian and I think maybe even Boba Fett's new look show up in this. Uh, really? So, yeah, so they were able to do some things that um, they wouldn't have been able to do had they maintained that original street date. Um, Jim, I understand you also have a copy of this in your house. I, I got mine for oh, yeah. Parker because he absolutely loves the Lego mm-hmm. the Lego games. Yeah, I had uh, an appointment with Dylan to go to the big box store right at 11 o'clock on uh, the day it was released to go pick it up. He had the day off of school. Um, also, uh, Michael Mack was laid up because he got his wisdom teeth pulled on Monday. Oh, all four yeah, of them. I remember that. So uh, I picked up um, a copy for Dylan and a copy for Michael. We just got the standard copies because we didn't pre-order. So there was a steel book Dylan wanted mm. and a Luke minifig that he wanted that he did not get. But he was happy to get the game itself. We got ours on the on the Switch. Um, as opposed to the Xbox, because so he can yep. carry the, the switch around. A lot of times we're yep. watching TV in the mm-hmm. evenings. But I got to tell you, so I was—I think I was more excited about this than Parker was because <laughs> you know I got the Amazon uh, notice that that it had been delivered. Yeah. And at first I was gonna like hold off and give it to him for Easter, and I'm like, no, I'm too excited. I want to see it. So I get home from the day job, and I'm like, dude, look what came! And he looks over, you know, up from his iPad playing Roblox, and he's like, yeah, huh, cool. He's really? down there playing oh. the Roblox. How well, disappointing. What, 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 come on. Um, and, and then I was thinking about the irony that I was encouraging him. You know, I'm like, you've had enough screen time. Now let's go play Star Wars Lego. <laughs> well, if you're going to be Which burning your screen. brain out staring at a screen, it should be with Star Wars. That's Not right. Any other, no other franchises. But that's just me. Yeah. That's 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 how I roll. But we okay. were so we were a day late in getting it started, and there's this yeah. epic intro, and you know where they're they were combining you know all nine films. That's the whole point. It's the whole Skywalker saga, you know, into this montage. And as Lego always does, they get such great voice actors doing these. You find yourself going, wait a minute, was that the real? Is that mm-hmm. is that who I think it is? And this is this this one's no exception. Uh, so many well-known voice actors and beyond giving uh, their their skills to this game. Um, and I was doing the same thing, trying to pick out who is voicing what. I have yet to see a full cast list be released. But I did notice, uh, I did get some, did you play it at all? I, I did get some gameplay in. A little bit tonight. A little bit tonight, yeah. The it's a lot of fun. How incredible. Yeah, it, it plays very smoothly on the Switch as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the campaigns uh, per film can take, uh, you know, a couple hours, maybe longer, according to uh, what I've witnessed so far. I've seen A New Hope get played through, and I've seen The Phantom Menace get played through. You can play but- in chronological order or... Uh- you know, one th- one through six, or film release order, from what I understand. Yes, yeah, it's a lot of fun, and there's great cutscenes, fabulous cutscenes, about three hours worth of cutscenes going on in this video game. And what I really enjoyed was hearing voice talent that are associated with the characters in these films, but from different. Areas of the Star Wars universe. What I mean is like the Clone Wars cast. Yeah. Voicing the characters that they're famous for voicing in the Clone Wars. But here they're voicing the characters in this Lego game and they're saying the exact dialogue that they were saying in the films. And then sometimes there's wacky 
there's wacky things thrown Lego in. Lego stuff. It is you know? Lego. Yeah. <laughs> right. You know, yeah, this yeah, is, yeah. Let, let's don't, you know, lose focus <laughs> that this is a Lego game, too. So there's wacky stuff. And, but it's so much fun, all those cutscenes. And um, I have an example of what I'm talking about here is uh, here's a scene with Anakin, Padme, and Obi Wan from um, Revenge of the Sith. And Anakin's voice by Matt Lanter, Padme's voice by Catherine Tabor, Obi-Wan's voiced by James Arnold Taylor. So you have your, your core of the Clone Wars cast voicing scenes that we know from the prequel trilogy films. And I just think that's just downright cool. So here's a scene from Revenge of the Sith, Anakin, Padme, and Obi-Wan as voiced by the actors from the Clone Wars. What are you doing out here? I was so worried about you. Obi-Wan said you had turned to the dark side. I have brought peace to the Republic. Together, you and I can rule the galaxy. Obi-Wan was right. You've changed. <laughs> the Jedi turned against me. Don't you turn against me. <gasps> Annika! If you're not with me, then you're my enemy! <laughs> It's over, Anakin! I have the high ground! You are the chosen one! I hate you! <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't mean to laugh because it's a really dramatic scene. But knowing, oh. <laughs> you know, having, you know, been privileged to hang out with uh, Matt and... And James, you know they've done this bit, you know, in their hotel rooms multiple times. This whole <laughs> "You're the chosen one." I hate you. Again. <laughs> I they hate fi- you. They finally get to do it, you know, on a yeah. on a legit project. Um, I do want to mention, and, and I was, I, I was, um, I went back. You know, I was listening to the show from last week, and I, I wish we had mentioned this before, but. Um, you know, Matt Lancher, if you follow Matt on social media, Matt had a, a pretty big health scare with uh, a situation um, that just a, a very acute thing that just popped up out of nowhere. Something with his, uh, I want to get into all the details that you can see it on if you follow Matt uh, or his wife, Angela, on social media. Um, something with his intestine. Anyway, it, it came up all of a sudden. He ended up in the hospital emergency surgery and it was a pretty scary thing. Luckily, he's on the men's. Um, he had to miss some, uh, there was a convention he was supposed to do the weekend that he got ill and, uh, he missed that, but, um, everything is is sounding very positive that he is doing well. I know Jimmy Mack posted something on some of the rebel force radio, uh, social media handles, letting, uh, them know that we were thinking about him. I got a message directly to, uh, Matt, uh, through Angela, letting him know that rebel force radio, uh, listeners and Jimmy Mack and myself were really pulling for him, praying for him and all that. So anyway, he heard it, he knows, and he's a- appreciative and he is doing uh, much better from what I hear. So God bless good. Matt Lanter. Yeah. Yeah. He's home. He's uh, on the mend, as you say. Yeah. So uh, good. And I, and I hope we'll be able to see him as scheduled at the end of the month in Nashville at ICC con. Mm. And, uh, then, um, he has not been announced as a guest for, uh, the Anaheim thing, but uh, they just started announcing he, the guests. I feel like uh, what last week. Yes. It's very, very late, very late. Yeah, yeah, but you know, uh, everything is always in flux. It's a, yes. right. It's the flux capacitor, baby. But great news: we found out that uh, it's official. Picks doing the autograph hall this year. Yes, uh, yes. celebration. I know that the uh, the reviews of the tops. Uh, handling of the autograph hall at previous conventions, you know, recent celebrations. They were not great from what I hear. They were not great. Yeah. Daniel Logan, he let us know. He was the the first to tell us that official picks was going to be back. And he's also the first to tell us that he was going to be at the convention too. Right. So (laughs) listen to rebel force radio. You get the news first for sure. Um, Another friend of the show is Stephen Stanton, of course. Mm -hmm. We love Stephen Stanton and have been tight with him for years and years and years. And uh, we we met him originally when he provided the voice to uh, Tarkin in Clone Wars. And that's probably what he's best known for voicing in Star Wars. But he's voiced like 
25 other characters in Star Wars. Man, he is it's up really there. Amazing. He may have the record, really. He might. He might. He's he's voiced a lot of characters in Star Wars, and he uh, continues to do so. Um, he's become the go-to guy for old Ben. Old hmm. Ben. Of course, James Arnold Taylor has a lock on Obi-Wan Kenobi, Clone Wars era and stuff, but when it comes to old Ben... They're calling on Stephen Stanton, and you'll hear why. Here's uh, we we know, we've all heard Stephen do the voice of old Ben before in uh, Star Wars Rebels Twin Sons episode from uh, uh, season three, but uh, Stephen Stanton is here as Ben Kenobi, old Ben in Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga, and he is uh, again. This is something that kind of thrills me to hear animated actors voice the dialogue made famous in the films and steven does that in this clip from lego star wars skywalker saga hello there so fortunate to be all in one piece ben ben kenobi boy am i glad to see you tell me young luke what brings you out this far this little droid he tells me he's looking for his former master Obi-Wan Kenobi? Is he a relative of yours? Obi-Wan Kenobi. Now that's a name I've not heard in a long time. Oh, you know him? Well, of course I know him. He's me. Yeah? Wow. Man, there are... <laughs> that's crazy. That's really, really good. Really good. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, uh, yeah. So, uh, always great to hear Stephen Stanton, um... I don't know if that's the only character he plays in this. Uh, there are this so thing. many yeah, characters. I, I, mm -hmm. I believe that this has more playable characters than any previous Star Wars Lego game. The the the, wow. the, the number of playable characters. So I think this is mm -hmm. this is one of the. It's, it's why these games do so well because you can go back time and time again and replay over and over, but as different characters. Yeah, you know, that's that's part of the fun. So you keep uh, you know kind of redoing it by like oh let's put this guy in here that's never happened before but yeah nine films you're gonna have a lot of characters yeah right right and uh another voice bringing life to some of those characters is another friend of the show from the clone wars the great tom kane oh, in tom. what could be his final voice performance in star wars and maybe even final voice performance ever because as listeners of this show know and who follow star wars news closely that Tom, unfortunately, had a stroke that robbed him of his world-class vocal cords, and it's been devastating and terrible, but uh, Tom Kane has an, a huge portfolio of amazing voice work that he's done throughout his career for Star Wars and beyond. Here in LEGO Star Wars, uh, he voices Qui-Gon Jinn, which is a voice I've never heard him do before, mm. but he, uh, he does the voice of uh, Qui-Gon in uh, The Phantom Menace. And, of course, he returns as Yoda. And, again, here's another example of Clone Wars actors reciting dialogue from the original trilogy films, which I think is really cool. And Tom Kane very, uh, very skillfully took the role of Yoda and, and made it his own, which I thought would have been impossible in the yes. wake of Frank Oz for right. some other voice actor to roll in and give us a convincing Yoda. And Tom King did it for so many years. Yeah. And he didn't try to just double it. He didn't try to go no. in there and just sound exactly like Frank Oz. He did make it his own, but it just worked. It Just worked. Yeah. It, it worked. So uh, we, we love Tom Kane, and we have a clip of him from the cutscenes from Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga. Here's Tom uh, recreating um, with humor <laughs> the death of Yoda. And then we'll also hear from the spirit of Ben Kenobi as well. Once again, Stephen Stanton will return. But here it is, the death of Yoda as played out in Lego Star Wars. <coughs> One thing remains. Vader. You must confront Vader. Is Darth Vader my father? Your father is. There is another Skywalker. 
Yoda will always be with you. Obi-Wan. The other he spoke of. Leia. Leia's my... sister? <laughs> Your insight serves you well. <laughs> <laughs> Bury your feelings deep down, Luke. They do you credit. <laughs> I can't. I can't. A, a Jedi is that one. It's like as soon as you give me a line, like I just got to keep going. Yeah, you love it. I love it. But love uh, it. but there was Tom Kane there uh, as Yoda uh, in what may be his final performance yeah. as Yoda, and and, and um, we get word from the Kane family that Tom is thrilled that this project has finally been released. His daughter, Sammy Kane on Instagram reports, we are so excited and maybe in tears. This is finally Ooh. out. Can't tell you how nice it is to see a project of my dad's being released right now. His lines were indeed all recorded before his stroke and loss of speech. My little brother showed him the trailer yesterday and he is so excited to see the finished project. Should I get my dad to play too? <laughs> Downloading it right now. Much oh, love and respect. I want to see yes. that. I want to see Tom yeah. playing uh, Star Wars Lego. Yeah, yeah. So uh, great, great for Tom. You know, he may have been silenced, but his voice will live on forever in Star Wars and all the other voice projects he's worked on. Star Wars Saga. Lego Star Wars Skywalker Saga, that is, is uh, now in stores and uh, a lot of fun. Getting rave reviews from everyone, yeah. from uh, my kids to all the uh, pundits on YouTube and, and beyond. And let me just say, I am the far that Jimmy Mac is more of a gamer than I am. I am the furthest thing from a gamer. You do not need to be a gamer to have fun with this game. The only thing you need is to be a Star Wars fan. And a game console, honestly. And you'll have a ball. It's not one of those games where you just tear your hair out and you just, you know, you don't know where you're going and all of this. Mm -hmm. It really, they really are um, uh, accessible, I would say, for, you know, whatever, you know, skill level you have. And if you're lucky and you got a kid at home, like I do, like Jimmy Mac does, you can just sit and watch them play. I like doing yeah, that. That's I like what, just watching Well, I play. love the split screen option where two can play at the same time. That's a blast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's a blast. And you can dive in, dive out. It, it doesn't matter. So right. uh, that's how I do it primarily. Uh, so, yeah, I, I was popping into the family room an awful lot yesterday. <laughs> I really <laughs> was. Yeah. So that's it. Lego Star Wars. Lego Star Wars. All right. Now, this, I, I, you know, sometimes we do these shows and... You know, they, they're they're behind me, and I and I don't I don't I don't think about them until we swing around, and I don't recall if we talked about the fact that the actor that played Luke in the book of Boba Fett, the 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 stand-in actor, was not the same actor that did it for the Mandalorian. I I feel like I'm learning this for the first mm. time. Oh, um, is that right? Well, I'm sure it was brought up on. The after show on the after show. I, I yeah. don't know. There was so much to talk about. That episode was so rich. Yeah. And honestly, yeah. I, I'm so caught up in the moment of it being Luke Skywalker and you know Mark Hamill that I have to stop and think. Okay, now this is you know this is obviously a younger actor and they're doing all this movie magic and stuff. But um, so I just you know I, I forget that it's not the same guy from from series to series. But Max Lloyd Jones who played. Uh, Luke Skywalker, the body double for Luke Skywalker in The Mandalorian, um, has recently revealed that he did not know that mm -hmm. Luke was going to be in the book of Boba Fett. This might be, Jim, a little bit of the method to the madness. Maybe that th maybe they go to different actors because they're trying in each iteration to keep it quiet. If, if Max mm -hmm. Lloyd-Jones is always the Luke guy, then when yeah. he appears on set or shows up, it might as well be Mark Hamill there because they go, oh, this must be a Luke Skywalker thing. And they did bring Max back in Book of Boba Fett as a different character. They brought him onto the set as an X-Wing pilot in that uh, sixth episode, the one with the Mandalorian and Luke and all of that. They brought him in as a, as a pilot flying with um, the other one, uh, Carvin, uh, Carson Tava, I believe that's his name, the, uh, the other pilot. Um, but... Uh, but yeah, he uh, he uh, was left in the the dark about Luke. I, I think he was sort of assuming he was going to be brought back, 
But this is just another story about all the secrecy that surrounds oh, yeah. Star Wars projects and how people working on the actual projects are left in the dark often. So uh, Max uh, spoke to uh, Metro UK and uh, discussed how he d- didn't even know that Luke was coming back in the Book of Boba Fett until he actually saw it on TV. <laughs> on TV, amazing. Yeah. John and Dave, them, they're just, they love to throw people off the scent, I think. So they did tell me, uh, what, you know, we thought about bringing Luke back and it was just too complicated and it was too much uh, technology and it was too expensive. I don't know, they said some reason why they couldn't bring him back. Uh, it's like, we would have loved to have you do it, but uh, sorry. But, but you know, here's this this other role as uh, as Lieutenant Reed. And so I was totally distracted, like, oh, whatever, give me this role. Uh, so I didn't think they were bringing him back at all. And then I watched the show. And, what? <laughs> uh, so it was funny, but I think they did a, a really great job with it. And I think the new actor uh, carried, it, carried it very well. And I, I don't think it's, I never felt, you know, particularly like it belonged to me or anything. I think it's Mark Hamill's role and the rest of us are just, you know, happy to help him animated in a in a in a space that makes chronological sense for the series you know and so i think this new actor did a great job but i think the technology looked even better this time i thought it was a little crisper and uh, they've clearly improved and worked out some tweaks i think and uh yeah there was obviously a lot more movement a lot more uh character and, and dialogue in this one than, than in my part um and it was just it was super cool to see you know those scenes of him building his Jedi Temple, the beginnings of it, what we've all kind of imagined and filling in those little gaps between the um, between the movies. So I was just I was just you know excited to to see them bring it to life. You know, what's funny about that uh, clip is that you know he's talking about how you know he's dis- he's discussing this idea of Luke. You know, is Luke going to come back and something else and. I'm assuming he's talking about, you know, Filoni and Favreau. And I was like, eh, it's really expensive. And, uh, you know, I don't know. Probably not going to ever do it again. You know, it's a big thing when it happened. And <laughs> then he's at home. Yeah. <laughs> Flip. He's like, oh, hey, the new episode dropped on Book Above That. What the hell? You know, I mean, they get to the point, you know, it's like, you know, we, we joke about, you know, you and McGregor, poor guy, you know, he went on record saying, I, I had to lie to people. I had to go on <laughs> TV and lie and say it made me look like I was begging for a job, you know. Yeah, um, yeah. it does put some of these actors in 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 tough spots where they're being lied to, they're being asked to lie. You know, the secrecy is just so out of control sometimes. Yeah, yeah, and surprising <laughs> to everyone. So they gave him a consolation prize and they let him be the X-wing pilot. Yeah, in that Mandalorian episode of Book of Boba Fett. And uh, so that was good enough for him, you know. Yeah, he, he, was he finally got his face in Star Wars, <laughs> and uh, he doesn't have to be just a mere body double. And so, what's the big deal? You know, I, I think he ended up with the better deal. Actually, you know, you could be a body double. Who cares? But when you're actually in the show, now you can go to the conventions and sign pictures and do all that stuff. So. He's not complaining, <laughs> and I can see no. why. No, and you know what? Hey, when the action figure comes out, at least it'll be his face and not Mark Hamill's face, right? Right, right, yes. So he actually gets to be seen on screen. So so good for Max, taking the high road. Max Lloyd-Jones, former body double for Luke Skywalker, now an X-Wing pilot <laughs> in the Book of Boba Fett. All right. Uh, oh, I love it when this guy shows up in our news feed. Uh, Samuel L. Jackson, Mace mm-hmm. Windu. Again, I didn't know this. I did not know this about the lightsaber hilt. Well, we'll, t- we'll talk about it here in a, yeah, yeah, in a we'll moment. That, but uh, anyway, he was on the Happy, Sad, Confused podcast with Josh Horowitz. Uh, mm-hmm. what, uh, he's a kind of a favorite of ours because he does not hold back when it comes to mm-hmm. asking the hard Star Wars questions. He's a, he's a real fan. Right. And, uh, and, and, and he's not afraid to ask the question. Yeah. And he's covering the entertainment beat. So he gets invited to all the junkets, no matter what the movie is. And if he has someone who has a history with the star Wars franchise sitting in front of him, he'll always show his nerd credentials by slipping in nerdy questions. Yeah. And, uh, Samuel Jackson's out doing some interviews for a new Apple 
Plus show he has on Apple TV. Um, I think they call it Apple Plus, or do they just call Apple it Apple Plus? TV? Yeah, yeah, everything's a plus now. Everything's, you know, everything's a plus. plus. I know it's all I plus. We're, this is going to be a Rebel Force Radio Plus from now on. <laughs> And the only hey, thing plus look for around Rebel here Force is the- Radio Plus to launch next yeah. month. Yes, for nineteen ninety five plus a month. Yeah, yeah, nineteen ninety five <laughs> per week. Um, <laughs> that's reasonable, right? Yeah, right. Uh, but Why yeah, not? RFR Plus. The only thing plus around here is going to be my expanding waistline. Uh, <laughs> after I have. All those uh, awesome Star Wars inspired adult beverages at the oh, yeah. rooftop the bash. bash next right. month. I can't wait for that. But that has nothing to do with Samuel Jackson. What does have to do with Samuel Jackson is the potential of his return to the Star Wars universe in a streaming series, maybe, or even a film, what have you. But Josh Horwitz asks, flat out asked Samuel L. Jackson if he'd like to return. And have you spoken to anyone from Lucasfilm about potentially returning as Mace Windu? And Samuel L. Jackson spills the beans. He tells you exactly who he talked to at Lucasfilm. Uh huh. That's a huge history of people with one hand returning in Star Wars. Uh, I asked, I asked, the only person I've ever said that to about coming back was Bryce Dallas Howard, because I, I just did a movie with her, and she directs episodes of The Mandalorian and stuff. So, so you think you might be able to right, hook a brother up? <laughs> and, uh, I mean, you like me, right? <laughs> and she's like, I love you, you're amazing. Said, Put me back in this. <laughs> Put me back Put in the game, in, I'm ready. <laughs> Put me in, coach, I'm ready. You know, I'll learn to, you know, lightsaber left-handed, come on. Put me up. <laughs> He so can do hook it. Him up. I'll do it. Yeah, right. In the hookup. <laughs> I mean, here we are. We got Samuel Jackson saying he wants to be back in Star Wars. Um, yeah, characters have come back from worse than what Mace went through. You know, sure, he's had to swallow a bunch of Sith lightning, lost a hand, and got thrown out a window uh, from a, a skyscraper that goes <laughs> about three miles up. But, uh, you know, he, it doesn't mean he had the force stripped from him no he still could have cushioned his fall if he had the uh you know the wherewithal to be able to to recognize the danger of the situation it's just that sith lightning that's the 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 thing about star wars is is you never really understand how powerful that sith lightning can actually be but it seems like even the slightest bit of it can devastate a well person. yeah it also seems that the sith that is shooting the force lightning can control the lethality of it so it's kind of like how if you see a cat sort of play with the mouse a little bit before it finally mm-hmm. kills it i feel like that's what palpatine was doing with luke for sure mm-hmm. you know he was torturing luke and then finally there's that moment where he says no young skywalker you will die yeah. And it really comes, you know. So when he says right. unlimited power, that's in 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 yeah. Revenge of the Sith. That's when I think he's really pouring it on. That's the heavy stuff. Yeah. Oh, good. I think we cracked the code on Sith Lightning right here on <laughs> RFR Plus. So I think there are degrees oh. of the of the lethality of the of the lightning. <laughs> So bring back Mace Windu, because yes. Samuel L. Jackson ain't getting any younger. Uh, the purple <laughs> lightsaber. The purple lightsaber yeah. has been something exclusively connected to the character of Mace Windu. So much so that any time that uh, it gets brought into a comic book or something, you see some Yahoo Jedi from the High Republic swinging around a purple lightsaber, that kind of frosts my ass a little bit. This I agree. The purple lightsaber, I think, really needs to stay exclusive with the character of Mace Windu. But, uh, you know... the. People working on comic books, they can't help themselves. They have to tap no. into that stuff. Yeah, right. I'm so but, tired of the blue ones. There's a purple yeah. one. There's only so many colors, right? <laughs> um, but lightsabers should be red, green, or blue. And that's right. it. That's Unless it. you're I mean, Mace Ahsoka's, Windu. Ahsoka's got the whitish one, and that's fine, too. And, 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 and Ray's got the gold. Ray's got the gold. Yeah, well, you know, I mean, that's always had kind of a connection to Star Wars because of the Luke Skywalker action figure from back in the day. Yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> that's right. Yes. That's, 
That's but, true. but the purple lightsaber yeah. needs to belong to the 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 bad mf'er Samuel L. Jackson, and and he he talks a little bit about the purple lightsaber. Now I'm sure a lot of uh, you our listeners, uh, you guys have heard stories about Samuel Jackson talking about the purple lightsaber. I think back to the uh, Attack of the Clones DVD, uh, the webisodes. Uh, there was definitely discussion of the purple lightsaber in those episodes. I even believe they captured the moment on the set where Samuel L. Jackson actually asked George Lucas about a purple lightsaber. Yeah. Now Ahmed we Best was there, too. We talk a lot about the purple lightsaber and Sam Jackson and Mace Windu, but... Um, do you ever understand what his connection to purple is? is it just a, a sort of a? He just likes the color. He loves he loves the color. He just because he's a, he's an he avid golfer, color. and you always see him out on the golf. When you see pictures of him on the golf course, he's always decked out in like a nice you know golf purple golf shirt, purple cap, mm. and yeah. Uh, yeah. So he just loves the color. I see. Okay. He just happens to have a connection to the color pur- the color purple. He's a big <laughs> Oprah fan. <laughs> um, but yeah. or he loves but, purple, uh, the purple rain. Lights, you know who knows. So, so we've heard Sam talk about it before, but I, I think he adds a little insight into uh, these comments here. So uh, let's hear what Sam has to say about the purple lightsaber with Josh Horowitz. In episode two, there's that huge uh, scene in like a, a stadium forum, kind of thing. Stadium. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's all these Jedi out there. And when I was reading it, I was like, how am I going to find myself in this? <laughs> so I said... Different color lights. <laughs> so, I said, George, can I get a purple lightsaber? They're green and blue. Like, what? <laughs> Seriously? That's it? Green and blue. No conversation. <laughs> and then we finished shooting reshoots. I had to fly back to London and say, I want to show you something. It's like, what? And he shows me a purple lightsaber. Zzz. It's already causing a shitstorm online, so I don't know if I'm going to keep it. It's like, <laughs> really? Come on. Listen, and how do people know, online know anyway? You know, and sure enough, when the movie opened, he was like, okay. <laughs> you get to keep the purple lightsaber. Because in episode nice. one, right. I never even got to pull it. <laughs> wow. So I, th- I found it interesting that George was aware of the fact that people were talking trash on the purple lightsaber, which is something I personally don't remember. I don't remember it either, but I certainly don't put it past. (laughs) I don't put it past people online. But we're talking about episode two. You know, I mean, keep in mind, you know, that's that's 2002. And it wasn't like we had, uh, you know, broadband was in every household. I think uh, if I remember right, uh, the, the, the trailer for episode two, I watched on maybe Entertainment Tonight when it debuted uh, or mm-hmm. something like that. It wasn't like we sure. were all running to our computers. So, uh, yeah, there were chat rooms, there were forums, there were things like that, but it was not like it is today. Um, though I, I, I have to say, uh, the very, one of the very first things I ever looked up on, uh, on the Internet when I finally got the Internet in my household was Star Wars. In Star Wars action figures, and it was, and it was, you know, that's that uh, man. But anyway, no, I don't remember that either. I don't, Jim. I remember the Jar Jar Binks uh, backlash, the In Sync uh, fiasco, which we've covered here on RFR. Um, but I don't remember there being a brouhaha about. Oh, you no. can't have a purple lightsaber. No, I was 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 very uh, warm to the idea. Actually, I kind of liked it. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I liked the idea of of setting Mace Windu apart from the others. Yeah, uh, he was our because first action figure from of of the new of the new Jedi. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, of the of the new prequel. Yeah, trilogy. Right, I mean, he right. Was right. The first character. Yeah. So uh, there's Sam talking about the purple lightsaber, but now here's the big reveal here. Uh, more from Sam Jackson as he's making the rounds, Jason, mm-hmm. uh, for this uh, Apple Plus show. And uh, he showed up on the Tonight Show Plus, and uh, he, he, he revealed some information to Jimmy <laughs> Fallon about the lightsaber prop, which he still owns. He still owns his lightsaber from uh-huh. episode... Uh, two and three and uh he he reveals something about it uh, that we never knew before yeah play the clip here we go you had the star wars prop team engrave your lightsaber with a special acronym is that true 
And no, they did that because they loved me. <laughs> I didn't ask for it. Oh, they did that because they... When they gave it to me, when the shoot was over, when they presented it to me, it had BMF on the on-off button. Yeah. And what does BMF stand for? Bad, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I I think it stands for Big Millennium Falcon. Remember uh, when oh, that yes. when the the Big Millennium Falcon came out from Hasbro? Uh, and I think we all know what that is. And uh, you know we don't need to explain. This is a family show. We know what BMF stands for. I didn't know this. Is this something that we we should have known from the past? No, this no. Is a new no, reveal. No. Yeah, he revealed it specifically on the Fallon uh, Tonight Show. Yeah. And uh, that's interesting. We, we we know the the BMF moniker has been stuck to Samuel L. Jackson ever since 1994's Pulp Fiction. At the end of the movie, there was a holdup in a diner, and the gunman demanded all of the customers' wallets. And Samuel L. Jackson, who was a hitman for the mob at the time, he was uh, packing heat himself. And he turned the tables on this gunman that was holding up the restaurant. And uh, he demanded the gunman hand him his wallet back. And they had the wallets all in a bag. And the gunman said, how do I know which one is yours? And Sam says, it's the one that says bad mother (laughs) on it. And it's one of the funniest shots in the movie. Uh, they, the, the guy goes, what? are you?" Ser-? And he pulls out in a wallet, and sh- sure enough, stitched on the wallet, they, they showed a close-up of it. It said, bad MF-er. And uh, got a lot of laughs. Wow. So uh, that's, uh, that's where that comes from, for those of you in the audience and Swank who haven't seen Pulp Fiction. I have not seen Pulp Fiction, but I know. Uh, despite the fact that the Oscars were somewhat stolen uh from the uh you know the antics of certain uh celebrities we we do want to say congratulations to samuel l jackson for his lifetime honorary oscar that was given to him awarded to him by uh denzel washington Uh, you know unfortunately one of the you know in the aftermath of the scandal of the oscars in 2022 no one seems to know who won anything but yeah, it is right, important right. to point out that Samuel L. Jackson did take home uh, an Oscar for a lifetime of achievement. He's 73 years old, uh, which, mm-hmm. man, if, if I can still, it's just incredible. Not only does he look great, but he sounds great. Like he hasn't lost, you know, sometimes when, when uh, people get older, their voices really change and all of that. But like Samuel L. Jackson is just I don't know. Whatever the this fountain of youth he's discovered, immortality, if he's a vampire, whatever it is, it's amazing because he just seems so much. He just is like immortal. He still has his edge, and yeah. that's why we love him, and, and that's why we would love to see him return to the Star Wars galaxy as uh, Heck yeah. Crazy Mace Windu. What's he been up to all these years? Yeah, I love all the different artist depictions, you know, that over the years of what a, um, you know, Mace Windu would look like, you know, yeah. if had he survived, you know, they, they always got him kind of missing an eye. He's got like a milky, yeah, cloudy, milky eye. Eye, cloudy eye. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it looks like he, he has some um, burns on his yes. face from the, the Sith lightning. Yes. So that's the stuff we want. I'm to partial see. to the ones where he's let the hair grow out. Yeah, where he's kind of yeah, got the too. crazy hair, like uh, like Saw Gerrera does. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to see some of that action happen, <laughs> but it would be it would be really quite wild to see him return in whatever way. I mean, even if he returned as a force spirit or something. Right. But if they were to bring back Mace Windu, I would want him to have one of those signature. Samuel L. Jackson rants that he has in his films. At, at, at one point, he always reaches this, this point where he he rants almost like a street preacher. And I love that stuff. And 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 also, like, laced with profanity. Yeah. Couldn't laced, you see I'm him totally uh, opening up about his bitterness, how the why the Jedi didn't go look for him, try to find him after that? I'd love to see a big monologue about that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I think the Jedi, they kind of had their hands full at the time. <laughs> there yeah. was Order 66 after all was happening. <laughs> That's no excuse, according to Mace Windu, in my head cannon. The double-bladed lightsaber, 
when you absolutely, positively got to kill every <laughs> in the room, except no substitutes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, let's check in with Star Wars and pop culture. This is one of my, my favorite parts of the whole week. Rebel Force Radio. You've already made that Star Wars reference. Your source for the Force. Star Wars parodies! <laughs> That's right, Star Wars parodies and moments when Star Wars invades. Uh, other parts uh, of the, the big fabric of pop culture uh, when Star Wars is referenced outside of the galaxy far, far away. And, and one, of our, one of our favorites here is the Goldbergs. Uh, Adam yes. Goldberg, the creator of uh, the hit sitcom, Huge Star Wars fan, seems to throw it in at any opportunity that he has. Uh, even even on the spinoff, Jim, if you remember, you, you brought us those clips from the Goldberg spinoff when they were in the prequel era. And they were all going to see uh, the Phantom Menace, the gym oh, teacher and the, yeah. the guidance counselor and all of that. That was um, But uh, anyway, so this is the Goldbergs and we got a new uh, Star Wars reference. Yes, and uh, this was reported to me by uh, the family. When I was in my studio, I got a call. Not a text, I got a call. (laughs) Goldberg's reference on TV, get up here. It was, get up here now. (laughs) So I was like, I'm on my way. And so I go upstairs, and Wendy looks like like her makeup's all smeared and stuff, and and you could tell she'd been laughing her ass off. Uh, Michael says, uh, Mom almost peed. (laughs) <laughs> and so I'm like, oh, this is going to be a good one. <laughs> this is going to be a good one. So this is, it's actually a twofer. This oh. is a twofer we're going to present you. It's two Star Wars references in one clip under 30 seconds on the Goldbergs. This is uh, a recent episode from just a few weeks ago, season nine, episode 17, the strangest affair of all time. Uh, Dave Kim's college plans thrill Adam. Adam, of course, is the... Uh, I'd say he's the main character on the show. Yeah, it it's seems like very the much an ensemble, from, but yeah. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all Adam's from his story. perspective. He's getting ready to go off to college. Dave Kim is his buddy. And uh, so he comes in and reveals some interesting information about college to uh, Adam. And uh, it, it, it starts with a Star Wars reference, and then it segues into some Star Wars weirdness, I would say. <laughs> As only the Goldbergs can bring it. Huge news! Carrie Fisher said yes to your proposal, and now you have to find a Han Solo-themed tuxedo? Better. I'm going to NYU, baby! Yeah! Beep, dop, ming, Oh, now I'm Oomre! Nepsha, Orkye, Victus, Ergbat. (laughs) (laughs) What the hell am I looking at? We developed our own private language based on the sounds of R2-D2 and Latin. Both classical and pig. We call it r Good God, man. <laughs> Our tootin. <laughs> Our tootin. So that's a good one. Almost made 1DP. I, I, I just love the good God, man, at the end from the sister. That's, it's like, I, I can't believe you really, you have crossed the line. Yes, from, right. <laughs> Into some sort of super nerddom territory. Yeah, it's, no it's, it's ever R2, been to before. R2 in Latin. It's not just the R2 beeps. You got to put and the pig. Latin spin. And pig. And pig, right. All right, Robot Chicken. We know yes. Robot Chicken. They've de- they've dedicated entire episodes to Star Wars. Uh, Seth Green, Matt Senreich, uh, practically members of the Star Wars family. And uh, Robot Chicken still kicking strong after all these years. You know, they're, they're silly little thing that uh, came out of a, a, a bit that was in the, the Wizard magazine. Remember the Wizard and Toy Fair magazines and oh, that yeah. stuff? Remember that? Well, oh, they yeah. used to do some sort of like action figure theater, and and that kind of is is what inspired and evolved into Robot Chicken as we know it. And uh, so, Rise of Skywalker, the final film of the uh, the Skywalker saga, has to get its treatment from Robot Chicken, and so uh, these clips are all parodying the rise of skywalker so here is the first clip it's palpatine's plan according to robot chicken (laughs) long have i waited for my grandchild to come home your grandchild technically the daughter of my own clone a perfect replica of me except nothing like me in any way think he worked at a shoe store anyway you got lost in the desert for 20 years and somehow got trained by luke skywalker all part of my plan 
Sounds like you were winging it. That's when I buried 10,000 Star Destroyers under the ice. Who built them? Better yet, who will fly them? Ice zombies? That's when we started mass producing ice zombies. <laughs> who staffed the ice zombie machines? That's for another trilogy. <laughs> I was also Snoke. <laughs> I gotta say, that is the most cogent explanation of the <laughs> sequel trilogy that I, you're ever going to hear. You're well, ever going to hear. I don't know. I, I think it's another missed opportunity for the sequel trilogy because where were the ice zombies? I think that would have really spiced things up a little bit. I guess so. Ice zombies in but yes. I just assume that everybody that was piloting and uh, crewing those ships in the you know the final order. Were some sort of ice zombies. I mean, they were inhabitants, or they, they were under all that ice, unless they were the acolytes. I don't know. We never really we saw know. many of the crewmen of no, those ships. Sure didn't. I would have liked to have gotten to know all of them, actually, but <laughs> it all just kind of was shoved in at the end, and we didn't get to spend time with anything. Right. Um, but Ray got to spend time with all the Jedi, if you remember. <laughs> All the Jedi, she was able to conjure them all up and uh, bring them, their spirits and their their strength to her at, at her most trying moment with the entire galaxy teetering on the edge. So you think you know how that went down in The Rise of Skywalker. Well, you might want to think about that again after you hear how it went down according to Robot Chicken. <laughs> Past Jedi, be with me, please. I need your help. We're here for Jedi. Oh. Hey, 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 don't forget me. Yarrow Poof. Remember me from the Jedi Council? With <laughs> oh, gosh, it is dark and musty in here. I'm here for you too, Ray. We're a dyad in the force. Dyad? Oh, so are we just, like, making things up? <laughs> <laughs> Like I said, there was a lot shoved in at the end. Of the, I, I, uh, I love that Yariel Poof is like this nebbish little character. Oh, God. What is he, Woody well, he Allen? Been, Jerry he, Lewis? Yes, very much. Yeah, <laughs> I think more like Nutty Professor, yes. Right. Uh, Jerry Lewis. He, he, he was introduced in one of those Robot Chicken Star Wars specials from several oh, so years the, ago. So this is a recurring bit. Okay. Yes, like, yes. Right. This is the return of the Poof. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm Yeriel Poof. That's, I tell you what, when Ray goes into her Jedi trance to commune with the great Jedis of the past, that's top on her list is Yeriel Poof. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, Swank, um, because I can tell that uh, some of your memories of the Robot Chicken Star Wars special, it, it, they might be a little fuzzy right now. Yeah, it's been I a long time, man. I cannot recommend more revisiting these specials. They're on HBO Max. Oh, great. Yeah, I've got so HBO Max. you can Max. watch yeah. them there. Oh, cool. And, uh, watch them all. Do the whole trilogy at once. It's a hoot, man. All right. I, I, every once in a while, when it, it's just it recharges my batteries almost. It's the Star <laughs> Wars parodies done so well. Uh, the final event, big event of The Rise of Skywalker at the end of the film was when Kylo and Rey kissed. Ooh, Jason, remember how the, the theater we were in on opening night just oh, man. blew up with all kind of uh, screaming and people oh. yelling, no! Was, I mean, it was mayhem. <laughs> it, was, <laughs> it was. It was. Mm. And, and, not all, and not all negative. I mean, there were a lot of, there were a lot of people that are into it. I got to tell you, I'll admit it. I, I was a shipper. I liked the two of them together. I thought it was great. I liked it. Yeah. I liked it. The, that whole trilogy needed some kind of romance going on in it. Um, For sure. You know, and I'm not somebody who often says that about any kind of entertainment. Boy, it really needs to uh, make this more like a Harlequin uh, paperback. <laughs> I, I, I don't normally feel that way, but I, I just think that that's an important ingredient in the Star Wars stew. And it's always been there uh, in every film, you know. Um, yeah, not it, not not even just like hitting you in the face because Kirshner is the one who famously said a kiss in Star Wars is the equivalent of intercourse in any other film. So you yes. don't need much. You don't need much. But what we're going to get here is Kylo and Ray kissing, which of course is the equivalent of intercourse in any other film. <laughs> so try to get the try to get that out of your head when you <laughs> hear this clip. This is Kylo and Ray kissing, robot chicken style. She's gonna die. Force healing power. Could we always just heal people with the force like that? It seems to me that that would have been a useful thing to know. 
I think, you know, I and a lot of other people assumed you two were at the very least cousins. All I'm saying is maybe let's do a little back of the napkin family tree before we lock any lips. Hey, Yarrow Poof, is it? Could you grab my spaceship and bring it around to take us up? Oh, yeah, great. Once again, Yarrow the Jedi Master does the grunt work. Oy. <laughs> <laughs> So there's uh, Robot Chicken, Rise of Skywalker. Like I said, revisit the Robot Chickens. I, I I think you'll find they've aged pretty well, and they're still just as funny as they've ever been. Wow. Good stuff. And yeah, they, they, you know, like South Park and Family Guy and some of these, they just keep being able to, uh, you know, just make us laugh uh, more and more each year. It's amazing the longevity of some of these. So we got time things. for one more? Yeah, let's do it, because this is one of my favorites. This is we're talking Batman, Batman Beyond. Yeah, Batman Beyond. Batman this Beyond. This comes from uh, Sean McNeil, loyal RFR listener Sean McNeil, says, watching some Batman Beyond, season two, episode 23, Centuries of the Lost Cosmos. Mm-hmm. About nine minutes, 45 seconds into the show, the main character, Terry, drops a Star Wars reference. Uh, and he says you can find this on HBO Max as yes, well. So uh, indeed, yeah, when you're done with uh, Robot Chicken, watch some Batman Beyond, and uh, and uh, this is uh, definitely uh, endorsed by Sean McNeil from Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona, and he says it's an awesome show. Um, I've seen very little Batman Beyond, uh, but uh, what I've seen, I, I, I like. I just never really dove into it. But in this episode, Batman finds himself in a battle with characters who seem to have stepped straight out of a popular video game. Mm-hmm. So let's see how the Star Wars reference fits in. They said they were sent on this sacred mission by the Wise One. Wise One? That's what Corey calls Simon Harper. The guy who created the game? He invited Corey to come and meet him. Do you think there's a connection? Is Jar Jar lame? Uh, oh. What? Another swipe at Jar Jar. Oh, man. Batman. It too, Batman. Uh, you got you to gotta throw Jar Jar uh, you know, under the bus? Wow. Um, it is a great show, and it is on HBO Max. If you like the Batman animated series and you haven't, uh, given Batman Beyond a try, you really sh- uh, you really should. It's very very good, and there's some strong rumors that we might see uh, Batman Beyond show up in the DCU on the big screen, maybe with a Michael Keaton as the elder uh, Bruce Wayne, which would be a lot of fun. I never knew. Now, and of course, Batman Beyond this was this was late '90s, so it's perfect timing for there to be a. A Star Wars uh, Phantom Menace reference. But, Jim, I'm speculating this had to have been like, you know, 2000, 2001, in the aftermath yeah. of the Jar Jar Binks uh, fallout. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, probably most likely. I didn't actually look up the actual year it was, but it was uh, season two. Yeah. So, uh, uh, pretty great uh, stuff. Pretty though. interesting Star Wars reference. Again, you know, you, you go back in time, uh, y- you really get a taste of uh, what people were thinking and thinking about Star Wars with some of these pop culture cuts. But uh, what we haven't heard is what Jar Jar Binks actually thinks of the show Batman Beyond. <laughs> That's what we haven't heard. Uh, Jar Jar, well, I, I here here's a clip. <laughs> Chewie, get us out of here. All right, that's going to wrap things up here for this week. Uh, Huge thanks to our very special guest this week, Galen Howard. Thank you, Galen, for hanging out with us on Rebel Force Radio. Really appreciate it. What a what a what a fun guy. I mean, I'm just glad that he reached out and we had a chance to connect with him and sort of meet the man behind the mullet. And uh, (laughs) it was a great pleasure to have him on the show. What a cool connection with his dad, James Howard, who did some uh, sculpting work and. uh, Return of the Jedi and the helmets, some of those iconic helmets. Very, very, very cool stuff. If you'd like more Rebel Force Radio in your life, we can uh, certainly recommend Rebel Force Radio on Patreon. Go to uh, patreon.com. You can get things like exclusive podcasts. These are podcasts that you're not going to find just by subscribing on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or something like that. No, you're only going to get them through the platform there at uh, patreon like rfr q a we talked about that at the top of the show the babu freaks uh clone wars declassified remastered the feloni files uh, all kinds of things there as part of those exclusive podcasts only available to rebel force radio patrons and another way you can get more rebel force radio in your life is through the rebel force radio youtube channel 
Check it out. We've got uh, all kinds of content there uh, at youtube.com slash Rebel Force Radio. It costs you absolutely nothing. It's a repository of Rebel Force Radio content uh, going back. You heard a clip earlier in the show from, what, 13 years ago? Uh, we've got lots of stuff like that. So if you want to uh, sort of go back uh, across the years of Rebel Force Radio coverage of Star Wars. Uh, the YouTube channel is a great way to do it. Uh, plus, we've added things like, um, you know, the full show uh, audio. So as soon as the show drops, it sort of drops in a live premiere format. The audio of the uh, Rebel Force Radio weekly show, you can uh, stream it as it's being released on uh, YouTube and chat with others that might be listening to it at the same time. It's very fun. Uh, classic interviews, parodies, uh, and uh, all the classic bits that we've done over the years, it's all available at the uh, Rebel Force Radio YouTube channel. Like and subscribe today, because uh, the more you subscribe, the more you like, the more that our stuff gets pushed out to other Star Wars fans who are looking for uh, similar stuff. It really, really helps out. I know you probably get sick of hearing people on YouTube saying, yeah, click the like button and subscribe, but it really does it really does help a lot. So we appreciate that. We'll see you next time. For Rebel Force Radio, I'm Jason. And I'm Jimmy Mack. And remember The Force will be with you always. Make it good. Rebel Force Radio. Or Tootin'. Good God, man.